Lion King ripped off Kimba the White Lion. We talk about it on Tuesday's Venture Podcast. Tune in. Uh. Hey, you disappointments. This is something I want to talk about. In 1965, a series called Kimba the White Lion was created. And what really pisses me off to find about this, because I loved Lion King. And I just found out that Lion King was ripped off from a 1965 series in Japan called Kimba the White Lion. And if you look at the similarities between the two, and I have them up here so people can see it on YouTube, you can just see how similar the characters are. Simba, Kimba, and Simpsons even made a joke about that saying, oh, I'm sorry, Kimba, I mean Simba. And what doesn't piss me off is that Lion King took it. Not only did they not take it, the, the actor for Simba, said, oh, I guess I'm playing Kimba in the studio as a joke. He said that multiple times as a joke because he grew up and he knew the 1965 series adaptation. Now, 1989, both decided to make a film. Kimba the White Lion decided to make a film in 1989. And uh, so did Lion King. Now, Lion King was making a movie. Now, Lion King made their movie in seven years. Kimba the White Lion made their movie 10 years because of uh, complications during the, the film shoot. So after all this, now Kimba the White Lion came after. So Disney, being Disney, knew they had power because some people say, okay, what's this film adaptation? They ripped off Lion King. But it's actually the exact opposite. And instead of being cool with it, and instead of saying, you know what? It's okay. We actually took it from the series we are inspired by. You could say we we're inspired by because technically you could really take from other things. But if you look at these like shots, they're very, very similar between the two. And some of this is from the series and some of this is from the movie. And if, I, if I'm going to be really honest with you, it pisses me off because Disney filed a cease and desist order against the people they took from and then pretended that was their own thing. Now, this is the first time this happened in movies. And I understand that you can get inspired by certain other films and it's not technically ripping off. Like technically you could say, okay, you ripped off this because it's a superhero movie and there's a bunch of superhero movies. But when you look at the side-by-side -side comparison between the two, you can clearly see the resemblance between Simba and Kimba. And even the character, the antagonist of it is called Scar in Lion King. And in this, it's called uh, Claw. And if you look at him, his one eye has a scar all the way down his face because he got clawed at. Now, there's so many similarities between the two. The bird looks similar. They have the hyenas as, like, uh, they're, they're also antagonists, but they're kind of, like, comic relief characters in a certain way as well. Now, if you look here, you'll see that, yeah, the antelopes come and they start trampling over. Very similar scene between Kimba. And there's also one where they're isolated on top of water here. It just shows you how similar between the two they are. And then you see Kimba holding on for dear life trying to stop the rapids. And the other one's an antelope. And the other one, that's where Kimba dies and Scar takes over. I mean, the Kimba's father dies and Simba's father dies. And they both run off into the jungle. And now Scar or Claw becomes the main leader. And it, it's just painful. He said, look, and this, the Pumba is right there. You can see it on both sides. It's the same boar who he became friends with. And eventually, he discovers this new will and he gets back on his feet. And it's a redemption story. Because now his father's dead and he has to come back and make things right. And the one on the right, instead, he starts eating grass, I guess. And they, he doesn't, of course, like it. When the one on the left, he eats bugs, which is more likely. And when they grow up, and they grow up uh, isolated and away from their original home, they have a monkey that tells them the same type of advice. And of course, there's a romantic interest that he eventually meets up with again. It's just, it's painful. And the romantic interest continues for a little bit, of course. And now here comes the revelation. His father somehow appearing to him as uh, some symbolic uh, ghost in the clouds and it's the same it's the exact same way except the one on the left is a bit more um obvious of mufasa literally just talking to his son and the one on the right is him looking up in the clouds trying to grasp at his father now 
this is honestly just like when someone says, hey, can I copy your homework? Yeah, sure, man. Go ahead. Just make sure you change it a little bit so that no one notices that's the exact same. And the kid just is like absolutely lazy. The kid just goes, oh, yeah, sure. And he just erases S, puts a K. I mean, erases a – fuck, I, I screwed up. He erases a K and puts an S in. And then he's like, oh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same. I don't know what you're talking about. Scar. No, I didn't say claw. I said scar. Jesus Christ. And then eventually, if you look here, he comes back. He goes back to his area and he fights to get his throne back and be the rightful king. The similarities between the two is pretty damn ridiculous. And now they're both fighting, and they're at the edge. This scene look familiar? And now, at the very end, where he's able to come back up. See, the one on the right is a bit more silly. This is the 1965 version. That's why it's it's not as animated. Like this is a this is a more than 30 year difference between the two. That's why I like the state. That's why if you look at the animation on the right, it's a bit more poor. And even then, he climbs to the very top and roars because he is now the king of the jungle. So now that that's over and I've done my venting, I'd like to talk about what's going on in the movie industry right now. There's so many sequels, if you look out there, like Transformer movies. Uh, there's so many sequels of Marvel movies. So, and there's also new creations like Ant-Man and, and even DC's trying to get in on the superhero uh, trend and the Batman versus Superman, which is absolutely awfully written. And all these films are just trash. Like if you actually listen to the writing and how much time they spent, it is utter trash. They just add some CGI and they know it's going to sell. And the reason why, even if it's rated bad here, they keep making these crappy films on Rotten Tomatoes is because they know for a fact that the east side of the world Oh, we'll only go see a movie, by the way, if it's in 3D, a 3D, a sequel, or a superhero movie that's related. And they have to have characters from the superhero movies there. That's why Marvel makes so much money. Because not only do some of the ones get good ratings here, and Iron Man was amazing. I liked Iron Man. The first Avengers was good, but then it kind of became muddled after that. The reason why those do so well is because not only are they applied to the west side of the world, with good writing. They also capitalize on the east side of the world. They have 3D superhero sequels. That's all three. So not only are they following the trend, but they actually have some good writing along the way. But now it's starting to become, it's time to become, it, it's too much. It's too much of the same shit. I can only, look, I love a T-bone steak. All right? T-bone steaks are amazing. But if I eat a goddamn T-bone steak every night, I'm going to get sick of it. I'm like, oh my god, a T-bone steak. That's what the movie industry feels like right now to me. It just feels like the same story retold with a different person. The only one that was a little bit de decent was Wonder Woman, which was actually told with some conflict. And I do like uh, Gal Gadot, if I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, it just... It just I don't know, maybe I'm I'm just the uh, one who's in the wrong here. But Ant-Man? Ant-Man? Really? They even made a joke. Really, Ant-Man? What's next? In the in the movies. Ant-Man was trash. And that's because they actually went in and took the writing out because they thought it was too much, the original uh, written script, and they replaced it with more kid-friendly content. It was actually going to be a funny, good movie. And when I went to go watch it, even though I begged my friends, please don't make me go watch Ant-Man. I don't want to go watch Ant-Man. He's like, come on, come on. We'll just laugh at it together. Come on, man. Let's just go see it. I'm like, all right, fine. I saw it. It was trash. And I don't find it funny sometimes. Like, so you know, you know, a movie's bad, like Sharknado, and you go see it, and you're like, ah, yeah, it's trash. And then they make another one. I'm like, stop seeing that movie. Look, I know it's funny to laugh at bad quality movies, but now you're making a market for more people to make bad quality movies, and for the people who actually want to go watch a good movie, you're going to go see it because it's trash to laugh at it. And they know it. Sharknado was absolutely ridiculous. It was stupid. And people loved it because there was satire and they admitted they were stupid. So now you got a bunch of stupid films out there trying to be overly satire like that. Or they have bad jokes now. And when I watch the new Avengers, I know what some people say, but half the people died at the end. 
And I'm like, yes, it's about time. Holy crap. It's about time these superheroes had like conflict where they did. It's not just a happily ever after ending. I'm so happy they killed off half the characters. I was loving it. I love the ending. And some of the pe- I remember the person at the end of the film was like, Stark, don't let me go. Like Spider-Man holding on to him. And so one movie was like, dude, that sucked. That was a shitty ending. I loved it. I loved Tom Holland being killed off. Not because I hate Tom Holland. I just like the fact that these people are still mortal. That as long as they take a risk in their lives, they can still be killed off in the end. They're not just like such a cliche of they there's a nerdy guy, nobody respects him, he gets a superpower, and his life changes around, there's a little bit of conflict, and then they give some bullshit superhero speech like never give up or blah blah blah. And then they and then they thwarts the bad guy, or gets the girl, or the girl like gets the guy, and it's happily ever after. And you just paid twenty bucks or 15 bucks for the same goddamn film you've paid for over and over and over again. It's the same fucking film. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed in the fact that it, it, no one died differently. That's why I liked the concept at the very start of The Walking Dead. And I like the concept of Game of Thrones. You don't know who's going to die. You root for that person. And if they die, you're like, fuck. But you still watch the series because there's still enough interest in it that it makes you want to watch it. And they actually feel mortal. When a fight scene happens in a movie, how on the edge of the seat are you? Not the cinematics, not the explosion, not like, oh, that was a cool scene. How on the edge of the seat are you like, I don't want this person to die? You see, that's been lost in a lot of movies now. You're not at the edge of your seat unless you're watching things like Game of Thrones and Walking Dead because you're like, oh my god, this guy might actually die here. And screw you over. But when you watch, uh, when you watch modern day uh, Marvel movies, you're like, I know they're not going to die, except in the new Avengers. But one of the concepts that I would say is that I like Black Panther because the evil person had a reason for what he was doing. You gave a reason for the evil guy. They didn't just have an evil guy who was like, I'm the evil guy. I don't like people. This is the re- That's why I like Joker. People can relate to Joker because he's a cynic. People can relate to certain evil villains because... They have something interesting about them, the reason why they're doing all these things. They have a cause. You can't just give an evil person who's evil for the sake of being evil. Joker as an evil is more showing that these people aren't what they say they are. Everyone's full of shit, and I'm going to prove it to you. He's not just killing people sensibly. He gives people a false set of control, and then he shows, look, Batman, look at what your people are like. Which is why I love The Dark Knight so much and why it's so well written, why it's done so well. I don't like people like Superman. You know why? There's no conflict. There's nothing like... A, there's a scene where a minigun... Someone takes a minigun, shoots him right in the eye in one of the movies, to flex right off. Like, where do you go from there? Do you have to always get an alien creature? Like, oh, who's this guy? You know, is this, and the same thing happened with Dragon Ball Z. And the same thing happened... Like, you, you made your character so powerful that you've let, left really little room in terms of writing of where you can go from there. Because now, instead of even, like, at least Dragon Ball Z had, like, he leveled up over time from screaming so much. At least he's like, oh, this is one, this is two. And it can it keep, keep going up, at least. The problem with Superman, he's already there. At the very start, he's like, yeah, I'm powered by the sun. I can breathe in space. I can go back in time. I have heat vision. I can use, I can cool people down. I can beat people up with super strength. I can fly. It's like, holy fuck, is there an anti your powers? Are you just everything into one person? And that's why I, I don't, I can't relate to that. You made a god of a person, basically. There's no conflict. Okay, so the next topic, the last third topic I'm going to talk about for this podcast I'm going to talk about cell phones. Now, the cell phone, when it was first created, or at least a portable phone, it was like, it was a Nokia, something like that, like a big, huge, ginormous portable phone. And that was absolutely ridiculous a long time ago. And then the cell phone came out, which was inspired actually by Star Trek, like the flip. It, and it worked. It worked for a brief moment in time, the cell, the flip phone. And it was pretty good. I didn't, I wasn't around the time when uh, people were getting flip phones. And it, people were getting cell phones in my high school. Now I was the, like the last kid in my friend group to get them. 
they all got cell phones. And they would all compare, like, they got, like, the iPhone 4 or something was what was out at the time. And they would be glued to it. In fact, it scared me seeing them use it and what happened. Because all of a sudden, in grade 10, all these people could have affordable phones and all these parents pay for them. And all my friend groups had, like, you no, know, they had parents with decent income. I was, like, more middle income friend group. Or at least upper middle class friend group. And they all had cell phones now. I didn't want to get a cell phone, actually. My mom actually asked my dad to get me a cell phone. And at first, I didn't really want one. But I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll take it at this point. And at first, it was used on like on Facebook back when Facebook was much more popular. It was just used to share cat videos. It was at first used to meet up with someone. And I was okay with that. Hey, I missed out on some things because they had Facebook Messenger. I had no idea how to use it. When I first actually got Facebook in like grade 10 and used it and made a profile, I actually hated it. I thought there was too many things popping up on my screen. I thought I went to like a wrong website when I first started using it because that's how much of an old man I am, even though I'm young. And when people started using their phones, something happened. And it's, it's not, I don't believe it's a good thing because, and I might be just a cynic, but when you're on the bus or when you're walking down the street, it used to be like you talk to people, like the awkwardness of the moment. Or just standing there would make you say, hey, what's going on? And you meet a new person. You socialize with other people. And I feel like something's lost because now you have this tap out way to be like, oh, this is awkward. Should I socialize with this person? And they're already on the cell phone. So you're like, oh, well, I don't want to disturb them. And you take out your cell phone. On the bus, I actually used to talk to people. And it's weird. I know. As a 20-year-old, a 21-year-old, I used to talk to people. Like, I'd talk. And people would actually look at me like scum. Like, oh, guys, talking. Fuck, screw off. I'm trying to be, I'm on my phone here. Jesus, why don't you just be antisocial like the rest of us? Why do you got to do that? And someone could argue, oh, well, I'm texting people. I'm texting people in my friend group, and that's not antisocial. But it is, because you're not willing to extend that friend group further. You've already made, like, a small set of people, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's still antisocial to have the same group of friend people consistently not trying something new or not trying to talk to somebody else and the when the cell phones came out one of the things that pissed me off is that not only were people glued to it trying to talk to people and i was the old guy walking around grade 10 going well you know, people used to talk to each other what really bugged me is that you know people keep getting these new cell phones i still have like a samsung old samsung it's cracked like i still and even to call people i actually have to plug in some form of microphone like the headset I'm wearing right now or like have a headphones that have some form of mic just so I could talk to someone because it's so broken and I really don't care that much like most people would have gone and gotten a new one by now I see the plan like I didn't take that initiative because it's not that important to me and there's no really room to grow on the cell phone it's like the tv like where you go from there you already have the biggest possible screen tv you have you already have the projector the tv is pretty much done there's not very much you could do unless you're talking virtual reality where you could move around and interact with the characters. But that's AI and that's kind of scary at the same time. But the cell phone, it's done. Like, how thin do you want this thing? You can call, you can text, you have all these apps. And what really pisses me off too, like a side note of the cell phone, you have all these apps now that are different. Like at first it was just Facebook. You, you post a cat video. You talk, and it was an update of your life, by the way. Facebook used to be an update of your life. Like, I'm doing something new, and I knew this person in high school, and that's interesting, or elementary school. And you get to see, oh, that's what that person did. And it's nice to use the update. Now it's like sharing philosophical stuff that makes no fucking sense. It's like sharing, a, uh, it's like sharing, a, the stars are bright, but make sure that you don't look too much at the stars and realize you're bright too. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? What kind of bullshit is that? You just pull that out of your ass and share. And then it's not even their thing. They're sharing someone else's bullshit that's not even good. So not only is it unoriginal and stupid, you actually saw someone else say that and you said, that's what I'm going to put on my fucking Facebook. Or they have, a, they have a caption. Like they have a picture of them doing something. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And then the caption has nothing to do with it. It's just like, people always doubted me, but now here I am. And I'm here to stay. And it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're, you're camping. What do you, what? What the fuck are you talking about? And these apps too that come out, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, you got you got your Snapchat, you got 
Instagram. Then it was Instagram. I'm like, all right, now it's four. And then Yik Yak started, and then it died. And then it's LinkedIn. And then it was this thing. And then it was another app. And now it's Spotify. And then there's iTunes. And I'm just like, oh my god, screw off. I know it sounds really weird. I'm like, oh, you're just such an old man. But like, I have one Facebook. Okay. And then I stopped Facebook stopped being a bit of a thing. People still use this. So I'm like, I gotta still use Facebook. And then I gotta use Twitter because of YouTube. And I'm not using Snapchat or Instagram at all, by the way. I have like two pictures on there because I'm like, this is too much for me. I want to still talk to people. I don't want to necessarily be the person always glued to the phone, update my Snapchat, and I got to update my, I got to update my Instagram, and I got to update my Twitter, and then I got to update my Facebook, and then I got to update my LinkedIn, and then I got to update this and update that. And at what point do you actually step back and say, I'm not living? I'm not living a life that I want. I'm living. A life with just pictures and videos specifically to show off to other people. I'm sh trying to show off to other people. And I'm validated by how many likes I get, by how many comments I get. Now, I don't validate myself in that same way. And obviously, if I get a bunch of likes and comments on YouTube, I'm going to be happy. But there's a certain point where you're not posting because you want to post and have fun. You're posting because you seek that validation in a certain way. And I know that might be like pseudoscience or some bullshit, but I just feel like when I look at people always on the phones and taking pictures just in that moment instead of enjoying the moment, it kind of makes me sad because people are going to look back when they're 40 and they're going to, and they're not going to say like, Oh, I, I, I had all these experiences and adventures and now I'm willing to settle down. All they were doing was like posting pictures of the cat sharing philosophical bullshit and trying to get the best angle of the lighting so they can do a stupid duck face while they're trying to go on a bus or something. Like, it just, it pisses me off. Like, you're not living. You're not talking to certain people, and you're not trying to gain or grow as an individual and do something with your life in a certain way. And I am guilty of doing similar things and staying glued to the internet, and I know that for a fact. But it's still annoying to see someone in public who's actually in public who's made the decision to go outside and do something and then you, you, you ruin it by being glued to your phone. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I just know that in a workplace environment, I actually tend as a 21-year-old, and I talk like an old man. I know it for a fact. I actually tend to hang around with the people who are middle-aged and up. Like the friends at work, like 75% of them are older. And I'm not saying it's like, oh, I'm so mature. It's because they they could take jokes not only that they could they could take jokes in the work environment and stuff if you go to a college and you're trying to make certain jokes people lose their shit and it's really sad because modern day society i was so left i'm i'm like i'm not completely left wing but i'm still like holding on to the concept of being moral but not ruining humor you can still be moral with your actions and still talk and joke around like other people and you are there's so many people going to the right that I know who were once really good left people who used to argue for the point of morality for the point of and it's not like I'm on a moral high horse it's it's this it's allowing companies to do the job but when they push it too far you're the person that says okay you need to cut that shit out okay these people need to get paid more for the work they're doing here or we need to stop shipping these jobs over to other countries and keep them here so we're a self-sufficient country. And the middle class right now is absolutely destroyed. And I know I'm just getting a bit off topic from the original cell phones, but it, it, it just pisses me off that so many people who stood for the same things I stood for are now so angry that they've gone to the other side of how they think or to the right side because at least they can take a joke. At least they're not on your ass about, I used the wrong pronoun, or I made a gay joke, so I automatically hate the gays, or I made a white person joke, so I automatically hate white people. By the way, if you made a white person joke, you're completely in the clear, because we had no, because people won't really mention the past discrimination or anything that happened there. And they pity, based on pity, is what you're able to do. Like if a woman, women been discriminated before, women, it took a while for them to actually be able to vote. And they were abused, and they still must still are today. I'm not saying there aren't. But notice how I have to set it up that way. Notice how I had to originally start off with women had discriminated in the past. I'm not saying some aren't. 
The fact that I have to defend myself as if I'm in a court case. And comedians have to do it too. You can tell the person who went through discrimination in the past and how well people can take a joke today. But they have to set up almost a pre-apology. Or they say, I'm an idiot. Or what do I know what I'm talking about? They know what they're talking about. They're just trying to make a joke. And they can't do it because they don't want to lose a job. Because too many people are a fucking pussy. That's the fact. I'm offended because I w- I'm a... If you're a black person and someone makes a black joke, but they also made a white joke, also made a fat joke, also made a woman joke, and you didn't care at all as a black man, but all of a sudden they made one black joke and you lose your shit and claim it racist, that's not racist. They made a joke about a bunch of other races and sexes, and you just chose to get offended when they mentioned you. That's selfish. That's not racist. You didn't stand up when they made jokes about the other person. You didn't stand up when they made jokes about the other group. But when it's your group, now you care. That's the difference. And that's what actually pisses me off. They make a bunch of man jokes. You know why? And they don't have to set it up. They don't have to say like, oh, listen, you know, I'm not saying this for all men. And obviously some men are abused today. Watch comedians. They never have to do that. You know why? Because men can take a joke in a certain way. Men don't get as much sympathy or pity in society. So they don't have to set that up. Listen next time you listen to a comedian. Really listen when they talk about or joke about women or a joke about someone who's been discriminated in the past, black people, brown people, listen to how they have to set it up unless they're that person, unless there's a black guy talking about black people, like Chris Rock or Eddie Murphy who makes jokes about black people. Chris Rock went off on certain things that black people do. If I did that same thing as a white dude, the exact same joke, people would be like, is he he a Klan member? Like, I don't, what is he doing? I don't, (laughs) that's the difference. Now, I'm obviously in a perfect society. People could joke around, be comfortable with each other, and understand that a comedy area is to joke around about modern day things. Even like everything is allowed in comedy. In a comedy section where you go to laugh, there's no such thing as too far, in my opinion. Unless you're singling out the people in the crowd specifically and you're just roasting one individual person. Then you're not being so much funny as you're being more of a bully, unless they say we make fun of the crowd previously, then you know what you're walking into. Then I understand. But if you're just making fun of groups as a whole, and you happen to be part of that group, and you choose to be offended, that's on you. Because part of comedy is being a bit mean and truthful and joking about it. it it's actually a complaint of hate towards certain people and how certain people act. A comedian's worst nightmare is a perfect day. Because a perfect day is where do you go from there? I walked outside. The sun was really bright. It was perfect. The wind was perfect in my face. You can't make a joke out of that. Where's the joke? There's no conflict. It's a perfect day. It's like writing a movie or a story of a book. Something screwed up has to happen for it to be funny or it to be interesting. That's why I think in a perfect world, there's no such thing as a perfect world because a perfect world would be boring very quickly. Now. The concept of just when you talk about these things is that so many people lose their jobs. And like one of the things I have to say is about Louis C.K. And I know it's a controversial, but he what he did was he asked he was in a position of power. That's true. He did it and he had a wife. That's also true. He should be shamed for that. And he was. And he asked women privately to jerk off in front of them. And yes, she could. And yes, you could just say no. Can you imagine? And if you think about like, okay, but that said, sometimes it's uncomfortable and she's in a position of power. Think of the reverse. Think of the reverse. If Sarah Silverman walked in as a comedian, there's four groups of guys or two groups of guys, and she goes, do you mind if I flick my bean in front of you? Or do you mind if I uh, masturbate in front of you? And if the guy said yes and then complained about it later, what kind? how do you think the news would spin it? How do you think it's like, you know, and then she took off her pants and then she did this. And I know it's a bit different because Sarah Silverman's actually good looking. So if you take someone ugly, an ugly female comic, and you say, do it, you could just say no. And if you end up doing it and then regretting it, that's still on them. That's self. You made that choice. And although they're in a position of power, yes, they should be ashamed in a position of power. And they socially were. At what point do you realize this person has been punished enough? At what point do you realize that let this person have a second chance and let this person come back? 
Now, every time someone sees Louis C.K., they lose their shit. Or worse, someone who was friends with Louis C.K. says, I don't know that guy. Hey, I don't know that guy. Hey, hey, we hung out like once or twice. And even though they like went to the guy's wedding, people all – Joe Rogan even did that a little bit. He's like, listen, I know people say this everywhere. Like, I don't know that guy. But we really didn't hang out too much. And he did the same line. He actually at least admitted it. But then he ended up doing it right after. And it pisses me off because – no one just takes ownership. Of, yeah, he was my friend. Yeah, he screwed up. Yeah, he should be ashamed of himself. But he suffered enough. He had enough lawsuits enough. They got away with a lot of stuff that happened to Louis C.K. And now you can't laugh at his jokes because something that happened off the cuff? That's not right. That's certainly not right. And if you want to talk about right and wrong, how about the women that make false rape accusations against somebody and get off scot-free? And yes, that happens all the time. There's a woman who, and I'm not saying this like, if a woman's actually been raped, don't go say something. But they've been proven that they 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 have been raped, but it didn't actually happen. They did it because the boyfriend broke up. They did it because they were afraid. They did, they did it because the boyfriend broke up, or they did it to get attention, or they did it to get money. And I know some people are saying, oh, how could you say that about women? There are a bunch of bad people out there. And part of equality isn't just admitting a woman can be better than a man. Part of equality is also admitting that there are women who are worse than people in general. So you have to admit that there are women out there who are star good women. But at the same note, there are also people out there like men and women who are bad and have malicious intent. You can't just assume in equality that quality isn't about women are great no matter what. That's not equality. That's inequality. And it's and this level of balance that switch is because of past discrimination. You can't just say, "Oh, well, I don't believe you should." The women, you can't say that about women. This these people have ruined people's lives. There's a 17 year old boy in America, and this woman said that this guy raped him. And in this whole town, even though he was proven to be not guilty, the whole street accused him. Spray painted the front of his house, a rapist. They threw garbage at him, and the kid killed himself. He was 17 years old. And you think that's right? And she got off scot free. Not second, not nothing, nothing. She has a clean slate. And she drove a guy to kill himself. And you telling me, like, that's okay? Even though if you falsely accuse, you deserve, if you falsely accuse someone of rape, you deserve to get punished for it. You don't just get, ah, oh, you know, I was just doing it for attention, discovery. You ruined that guy's life. That guy went through a lot of shit, and there's no innocent until proven guilty anymore. And I know a lot of people on the left who will say, well, whatever a woman says is pretty much right. It's not right. There are women out there who are bad people. And I know when I say this, I might get some flack for this, but it has to be said. And it has to be stated. Because... If a woman can ruin a man's life just by saying a sentence of he raped me and drive the whole neighborhood to hate that person, something is seriously wrong. If someone can do that, if a man can can you imagine the reverse if a man could do that to a woman? You wouldn't take that. If a man could say, oh, she raped me, and then the whole society blames her, even though it never happened. She goes to court. People still shun her, say she's a whore, piece of shit, and they keep talking shit about her. And drive her to that point. And then at the end you find out that never happened. He was full of shit in the court of law. And there's evidence to prove it. And now every, and that guy gets off scot-free. After all that bullshit that she just went through. That guy gets off scot-free. Paying for lawyers. Having to defend herself. So she doesn't go to prison. And hoping, dear God, I hope I can get out of this. And you, people let this happen. And that's why it's it's actually really sad. So... If you want people to pity women, and that's what you want in our comedy clubs, and you want people to discri the pity discrimination because you had shit in the past, and now you are you want power, and you want malicious people to abuse that power of past discrimination, then I guess you should say I'm a bad guy and I'm in the wrong. Anyways, uh, I think that's a good time to end it. So let me know in the comment section below uh, what you think about Kimba, what you think about my talk about movies, what you think about how I feel about comedy clubs and what should be done. Anyways, uh, have a great day, you fuckheads.
Tschüss.